ACLU headquarters in Philadelphia. This is Cleats and Cufflinks. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cleats and Cufflinks. Uh, a rather crowded episode today. Uh, I'm here with, uh, of course, Dusty. Right, it's over on the far side there. And in between us, sandwiched neatly in between us, um, is uh, David Kuchlopati, VP of Operations for the League. So this is kings over threes for the full house. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we don't even have enough microphones, so you know he's just going to sit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just okay. quiet, very straightforward. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but yeah, we have a lot of we have a lot of show today. We had a busy weekend, of course, around the league. We got uh, some news to catch up on. We're going to talk a little bit about some coaching. Uh, but before we get started, we're of course going to traditionally, as we do, thank our sponsor. Uh, so thank you very much to our fine uh, sponsors at Heavy Seas Brewing Company down in Baltimore, um, where my wife is also from. So a lot of good <laughs> things coming out of Baltimore. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be having the Loose Cannon, which uh, tells me one Loose Cannon Hop 3 Ale is opulently hopped three times in the brewing process. Herbal and aromatic, an amazingly graceful American IPA. Herbal and wow. aromatic. Eh? I was really in the mood for something graceful today. This is working out for me. <laughs> and you got stuck with the two of us on this, on this yeah, show here. Yeah. So there needs to be something graceful on this set. The, the beer is going to do it for you. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, since I'm doing the double cannon again, I enjoyed the double cannon last time. Hop aromas blast out of this flavor explosion. Massively dry hopped with a balanced malt sweetness. This irresistible force showcases the power of bringing in the extra artillery extra artillery and 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 david what, what do you have in there i've got the uh black can uh black ipa uh while the style is an oxymoron the ale <laughs> <laughs> is a variation on our loose cannon ipa with an obvious dark nip so many, so many cannons lots of room. cannons this is a uh what do they call that there's a name for that many cannons a fuselage a fuselage <laughs> <laughs> is that <laughs> we're a well-armed warship is what we are right now so we don't, we don't be have very a successful navy. do we have an admiral we, need, we could use an admiral. I think next show. Well, we're just going to appear as many people on the set as we can. We need more, the course need of the more boats. Uh, but uh, a reminder to everybody, enjoy your heavy seas responsibly as we're going to. Cheers. 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 All right. Another week in the books. We've survived. Mm. Both life and Frisbee. Life. Speaking of life and Frisbee, you want to combine life and Frisbee for a moment. I played Frisbee. <laughs> uh, and people are going to be maybe kind of shocked to hear this, given that I've worked in Frisbee for four years now, almost. <laughs> uh, but this is the first time I've actually played an organized game of Frisbee in probably 10 years. I've I think. seen you play some semi-organized games. Yeah, in the a couple interim. little throwing arounds. I've done some points at Wildwood here and there, but uh, you know, with just kids and work and everything, it just kind of fell out of the pra habit of going to, uh, to actual games. So I played a summer league game, preseason yeah, summer league up. game, you know, uh, to warm it up. And uh, it, you know, it was not as horrible as you might imagine. <laughs> so my question about that is, yeah. do, do you find yourself playing the same role that you used to play it because for those of you who don't know what Nick used to do was play defense and by play defense I mean get blocks on people not necessarily play like lockdown shut down defense it's no. like I'm gonna as you've said in the past make it look like you're open which in technical terms means you're open yeah precisely. <laughs> wait for the disc to go up and then go get it so what do you do now when you I, know I was trying to explain that to somebody the, the key to good defense is leaving your man open <laughs> uh, you know, here's the funny thing I found, is the brain is relatively unaware of the physiological <laughs> changes that have happened over time. So it yes. wants me to do the same things. And literally, I don't think when I play, so it just kind of shuts everything down and tries to do some of those things. Uh, but no, I play, I, you know, I'm, I'm lazy handling when I can. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm really going for. I didn't, so this is an interesting thing. So summer league, different from club, I used to catch a lot of goals. I didn't catch a single one this game. I threw four. <laughs> that may have been the total that I saw you throw for the entire time we were on the same team together. I only remember one, so... <laughs> Uh, personally, I don't really play much anymore. It's v it's very sad. I might get to play a little bit of summer league this year. And we keep I you may... busy. Yeah, that's as soon as this season starts, <laughs> I'm done playing. It's over. Are you playing right now, David? Yeah, I am playing. I just started playing uh, summer league for the first time in about seven or eight months now. So, what's your role on the handler, uh, cutter, I'm a uh... slow handler, just like you? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. It is wonderful. By the way, I did not know how great it is to be the slow handler. I didn't know that that was... Because yeah. I, ne I never envied that position, really. <laughs> uh, but now that I'm playing a little bit of it... I actually, what I did a lot was I played... 
you know, they played zone on us because it's preseason, I guess, and they wanted to try their zone. And I just sat behind the cup and just moved into space and got the disc like every other time. It was perfect. I barely moved. I have a tendency to play the extra running handler who tries to be deceptive. Just the, yeah. You lose track of me. I'm a little guy. Yeah. You lose track of you because you keep running. <laughs> I haven't learned how to turn that off yet. <laughs> well, other than, uh, you know, sort of substandard uh, ultimate that I played, we did get to watch some good ultimate this weekend. Yeah. Um, so you were up in Boston. You were in Boston. Yeah. So you guys were both in Boston. I did not get to go to Boston, which actually for this game really upset me because it was Boston and Portland playing. It was a great game. And it was a great game. I will say, though, that I think it's probably one of the best streamed games we've done. It came across very, very clean when I was watching it. I thought you and Poster did a great job, and I liked everything about it. Um, there was that controversial call on that Woodside block. Yeah, that was a strange little play. Yeah. I'm still not certain precisely what happened. And I, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure any of the players or any of the refs <laughs> know precisically what happened there because there wasn't any good view to tell. And when you're trying to throw the forehand, there's this moment where it's still on the tips of your fingers, yeah. but it hasn't really left your hand yet, but you couldn't say that you were in possession of the disc. And he kind of just walked through at that moment, stuck his arm out, and I've watched the replay and tried to pause it from three different angles, and I still can't tell entirely what happened. It was either a block or a strip. And I don't it was know which definitely it was. one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting thing about it is that it felt to me when I was watching it like a makeup for the call earlier, Ooh. where he had that block in the end zone, that when I watched the replay seemed clearly like a block to me. I may be a little biased, but yeah. it seemed clearly like a block to me. I would say both of those are the sort of calls where you a decision has to be made, and while you can't be certain that you're making the correct decision, if you made the other decision, you still wouldn't. It's just it, it's one it's two sides of the same coin or the same side of different coins. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Uh, we had some good calls throughout the weekend, so we'll talk about those too. Uh, and some not so good ones. Did you see that play from one side? You... I saw a little bit of it. Yeah. A little bit of it? Yeah. I, I don't know what to make of it. Yeah, I uh, thought he got the block in the end zone too, but that other one, that's just a mess. It's a mess. We, we would have needed a camera like directly above the disc and directly below the disc <sighs> and slow motion replays from there yeah. in order to. Let's make a note for a satellite thing. camera if we could just. Get that, get that in the budget. And a mole camera. <laughs> and a mole camera. <laughs> we, need to open them. we need to trap them from all sides. Well, I guess we could solve it. I'm derailing everything I know. We could solve it by putting a, a chip in the disc, right? So then you could have information about how it's spinning. Is it spinning? Whether it's still contacting someone's hand uh, and all of that. And we're going to give them like little Premier League watches where it like lights up if they're <laughs> it's when it's up. <laughs> Works for me. I like it. All right. Technology. I actually had somebody from, uh, had a conversation with somebody from uh, a chip manufacturing company, which will go unnamed for now, about uh, putting a chip in a disc. So. This is a thing that I've actually spoken to professionals about, Fantastic. which would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's do quick. We're going to go through the games. We're going to give some brief impressions of these games, and then we're going to talk about sort of where we're sitting with the season. So a little around the horn kind of impressions thing, I'm thinking. So, Dusty, Portland, Boston, give us your, like, uh, synopsis of this um, game. Portland wasn't – I don't think they were quite ready for everything that Boston threw at them early in the game. Uh, they got down, uh, I mean, Boston gave up the first break, but then after that, Portland just never really seemed to be cohesive to get, like, Timmy Purston didn't score in the first half. Yeah, he scored nonsense. five goals on the game, breaking the uh, career record. He's up at 103 goals now, first player over 100 goals in the Yeah, NBA. hit the century mark. And, uh, we and were he very missed, excited about that. Like most of a season, too. Right, right. right. Like right. He did that while missing most of an most entire season. Most of that season. He scored nine goals in that one game that he played during that season. <laughs> so it still jumped up his average. <laughs> he did do all right. Um, so Portland eventually came back into the game during the second half. And they made some good plays here and there. They took advantage of their opportunities a little bit better. But the way Boston just sort of uh, uh, de uh, like accepted that pressure and absorbed it. Um, it was really telling about the way that Boston's been coming together as a team over the course of the season. Mm. And to see that happen from the east to west, it's kind of this, this notice out to the west that whoever comes out of the west is going to have to deal with a team, whether it's Boston, whether it's Philadelphia, that isn't afraid of them 
and is going to take it directly to them when they come out to play in the championship game. Let's not leave DC out. They still have a chance to get in there too. Technically. They have a, chance. They have a technical and chance. I've, and I've already gotten in trouble with some of the DC yeah, players I'm for sure stating that I believe that it's going to be Philly versus Boston <laughs> in the playoffs. But also of note from that game, t- uh, Cody Bjorklund also got up to 100 assists yeah. in that game. Yeah. And first player to 100 assists. And Jack Hatchett broke the blocks record career in MLU. He's up to 47 blocks, which was previously 46, held by Morgan Hibbert. Morgan Hibbert, Hibber. yeah. He's yeah. much smaller than Hibbert, so he is. So all it's, it's all him. the more impressive. <laughs> uh, so, what did you see in that game? They were like, who did you pick out as players? Like, what, what were you watching that you liked? Well, I think the first thing that I noticed from that game was that it's just a difference in style overall. Mm, yeah. And the West Coast style tends to be a lot of the deep looks, a lot of the hucks, and moving that disc quickly. And then, you know, the Eastern, you know, on the East, the the strategy tends to be, you know, come under, take what's open, and and just work it. And I feel like, you know, Boston is very good at adjusting to what they see. And I feel like Portland is very good at playing their game. I think that's what yes. they did. And, and, you know, Boston ended up coming out with that win, I think, because they were able to adjust. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. And the very last thing on that is that Portland didn't manage to generate a goal-scoring opportunity, really, on their last, their very last mission. They had an opportunity to tie it up and send it into mm-hmm. overtime. Yeah. And they didn't really manufacture what they needed to, to do. They ended up with way too many players behind the disc. Mm-hmm. Didn't really play out that way. So Very odd finish, I felt. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing I liked and the thing that I thought was, I mean, I would love to see Portland back over here. You know, I think that the, having this game over here, getting the idea of how the East Coast teams are playing, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. is going to give the West Coast team a better opportunity in the championship because mm-hmm. they're not coming in just completely raw into the conference where it feels like they're already at a disadvantage maybe because of the travel situation so and the home fan situation and all that stuff it's an away game there were a lot of portland fans there were a shocking number of portland fans they were really loud i love that they were lobbing some of the best heckles at the ref that i've heard (laughs) over the time that i've been in mlu Oh, I love a good ref heckle. One of my favorite <laughs> things. But I just, I mean, I, I won't talk as much about strategy and stuff like that. I really, though, really enjoyed watching the game. Like, I thought it was an incredibly entertaining on-field product, if I'm going to put it that way. Well, And I thought everybody got what they needed out of it. I'm excited. I'm going to watch it again uh, on Sunday because it's going to be on Comcast. Oh, that's going to be great. Nice. And I'm going to watch it again. Fans to the, to yeah. the West Coast games. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hat tip to Rafi Hayes for two of the most incredible skies during wow. that game. Did you see the picture from that one? Climbed up over Purston like Purston doesn't know how to jump. Yeah. <laughs> What's and that about? And Purston just <laughs> jumps. <laughs> yeah, that was phenomenal. Um, all right, next game. Jump to the next game. And I called this game. Uh, so San Francisco at Vancouver, up in Vancouver, Thunderbird Stadium. I caught the end of this one from the hotel room I was in. Yeah, it got a little jumpy for people watching the live stream out there. We apologize, technology issues, but uh, made it really difficult to call, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, very, calling it off a very small screen here in the office um, made me realize I could use some glasses. Uh, I think I'm going to be visiting an ophthalmologist uh, very shortly. Um, but I felt like that game was... I mean, there were, it was not a clean game, if I could put it in yeah. light terms. It wasn't a very clean game. We got, I got some uh, flack for being a little, I guess, harder on San Francisco uh, from some fans. I got an email or two. Yeah. Um, and they weren't incorrect. There's something about calling a game for a team that hasn't won a game yet. You just kind of want them to win. <laughs> and I, you know, looking back at the call, I think that I, that came across sometimes from me, which I apologize for to San Francisco because... In reality, I needed you guys to win and do better because most of you were on my fantasy team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was still a really entertaining game. I mean, I, I had a really good time uh, calling it, called it with Burt Katzen, and uh, his first time ever doing that. So, yeah. uh, but it was really fun. I enjoyed the game. I felt like it was basically coming down to though who could make one less error. Yeah, is what yeah. it ended up at. I mean, when we break it down, that's kind of frisbee <laughs> in the end yeah. that's that's what we're dealing with here it's a game of errors yeah team with the least turnovers team with the least turnovers and you got i mean the other problem is though that that there were also errors on the uh third team involved in the <laughs> uh, we had a really you know san francisco suffered from a really tough call at the end possibly two tough calls uh but the last one was particularly noticeable which is an out of bounds call um <laughs> <laughs> and our producer is kind of sneaking into the office. Right? You can hear it? Everybody pick that up? That was we work beautiful. in a haunted mansion. We, do. <laughs> we don't tell anybody that, Dustin. The rent is really cheap. 
<laughs> as long as you can get over the jangling of chains and that little girl in the black dress that runs down the hallway at you every time you come in, it's fine. Oh, oh. <laughs> she's not real? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I felt at that end of the game call, there was an out of bounds call. We go back, you know, this is the thing. This is where MLU differs from a lot of other ultimate that takes place is we have so much footage. And you go back to each of these calls and the, the, you know, it's obvious that he was in, unfortunately. Um, and it's, it's that the footage serves all the teams. It serves all the individual mm -hmm. teams as well as the refs. It's this sort of thing where you can look back and see what you aired on and move forward, hopefully in a better way and yeah. not make the same errors twice. Yeah, oh, definitely. And that's what they do every week. They go every week and they review every single uh, play, you know, all the footage from every game, and attempt to do better. Yeah. And it's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not that. easy. And the great thing about that play is you can see what happened. The referee who was in the middle of the field made the call rather than the referee that was up the sideline. Mm -hmm. Whether that was because that referee got sucked out of position or something, I don't know. But that's the great thing is that our ref and crew will be able to go back and look at that and say, let's figure out a way to adjust so we have a better, with better eyes on that yeah. next time. Unfortunately, it doesn't change the result of the game. The game exists. It's, you can't change the game. It's hermetically sealed. It's hermetically sealed. <laughs> by the past. As soon as by you, time. If you open it up, it loses value, just like all my action figures. <laughs> I have one action figure. It was an, it was an Allen Iverson action Ooh, figure. It was a gift. Of, of course it was. <laughs> my father told me that if I ever have a desk, I need to put it Front and center. Front and center on the desk. We've never seen anything like Allen Iverson before or since. No, phenomenal player. I'm glad too that we that I brought up the uh, the action figures because I was worried we wouldn't get any basketball into this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not going to talk anyway. All right. So, what? <laughs> any any comments on this game? Did you get a chance to watch this game yet? Because I, I know we have a lot of games to watch. Yeah, so I've only seen highlights of it. Okay. Um, and how about you? Do you anything from an overview perspective uh, on this one? The, the errors in that game were spread out evenly. Hmm. Although I would say that both of the teams made fewer unforced errors than they usually do, and they were actually sort of pushed into the errors by what the defense was doing more often than usual. Yeah. Vancouver finally scored over 20 points. Yeah. So that'll lead you to a win. Yeah. You know, rather than sitting underneath 20. It should be mentioned, double right overtime way. as well. So, yeah. you know. Very close game. Yeah, kept me here very late. <laughs> <laughs> It kept me up after the basketball game ended. I was still watching the frisbee. I had been watching them on two You're screens. Doing the double side screen. Side. Thing, yeah. yeah. No, it was it was very exciting. I really enjoyed that. Um, next game, less exciting, significantly less exciting. Uh, San Francisco coming off of that hard double overtime. Uh, yeah. uh, came down to Seattle and frankly looked a little spent. Mm -hmm. um, now you, being kind of a crazy person, actually only kind of. Called the game in Boston and then immediately flew out. Well, I got to sleep first, but I you flew slept out in the first. Morning. Okay, yeah. flew out in the morning to Seattle to Did catch that, that game. Did that whole one day thing? Fly out, fly back on the red eye. Yeah, it was yeah. great. I was really happy to go out there. I got to see some of the uh, some of the players. I got to meet some of the players that I've spoken to uh, over the internet. Uh, see them in person. Um, I got to catch up with some of the folks that I did know. Uh, the game itself. Um, it wasn't what it wasn't really what I wanted to watch. It just I mean, it's twenty nine to sixteen. It's a thirteen yeah. point loss. And San Francisco didn't get a break into the fourth quarter. Um, I'm not sure if they looked tired so much as as soon as they made any error, uh, Seattle scored. And they got ahead early. And then there was no way for San Francisco to find their way back in. They couldn't use any midfield pulls because they weren't scoring. Yep. So it was very difficult to watch that game almost mm -hmm. in a sense of, I want the game to be competitive. I want to see the two teams like give their best and see what happens next. In this scenario, Seattle was giving a very good game. Yeah. And San Francisco, while they eventually got some breaks in the fourth quarter and did a good job, like they were trying throughout the whole game. It wasn't like they gave up. It's just they didn't have it. And sometimes this is what this is a lot of what sports is about is when you don't have it, when you're bound to lose, how do you comport yourself? How do you deal with that mentally? How do you deal with that physically? And uh, I learned a lot about both teams, what they do structurally and how they uh, play a couple different offenses, a couple different defenses. And that was kind of what I went out there for. But the game itself, not the best game to watch on this weekend. Yeah. Possibly the worst game to watch on this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that. I think that's a pretty safe, safe and accurate bet. And to be fair, I mean, Seattle's 
Seattle's looking pretty good. They're building things together, and they're missing fewer of their play- fewer of their players as the season goes on. I'll, t- I'll tell you this from my perspective. I-, I love having a game on a Sunday so that you know I get to watch a game. Yep. You know, because typically, especially if it's on a West Coast game, because I go to a game usually most weekends if I can. Um, so one day is taken up with travel or doing something. So it's nice to just it's nice to just sit on my couch at home. <laughs> and you know, Premier League's over, so I don't have my I don't have my footy. <laughs> I need something. <laughs> but it was great. It was great. I watched the game, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a good game in terms of the competitive nature. I will say this: I will watch Khalif play in any game that I can. He's just just pure entertainment. He, he takes such joy in playing, and it's he communicates it across seems, the screen. He seems to have just no fear. Yeah. When he's playing. Like he's not concerned that it's going to be a turnover or this he just has confidence and a lack of a lack of fear. And again, you mentioned the joy. We saw that in the in the championship game last year, even though they got the doors blown off. Yeah. They were still having fun. So much that team has fun. I mean the Seattle team just has fun in general. Um last game of the weekend. Unless you want to add anything on that, because literally this is the problem with sitting between Dusty and I as we talk. Incessantly, uh, <laughs> but this is just like normal anyway. So. Yeah, no, this is yeah, this yeah. is when you're at, when you're in a normal situation with us. Uh, so last game of the weekend uh, was not billed to be an exciting game. Didn't seem like it was going to be, but then DC did what DC does and gave the fans what they wanted, which was a little bit of drama at the end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> They got so, some. They got some drama earlier on, also. Oh my goodness! As there was a. Do we talk about this drama first? Uh, let's yeah, talk let's, about it first. Let's talk about. It. I mean, let's talk about it first. It's, a, it's the sort of play that you don't get to see in club games because you're not allowed to tip the disc to yourself. But in this particular game, there was a swing pass from New York that uh, there's a little miscommunication. The player cut up line or curled out, cleared out of the space. Swing pass goes up. Dorico Johnson, who is a very good defender. Um, generally playing on the offensive line this year, but still a quality defender, sees the pass, knows that there's no one around him on the other team, and decides, I can get some extra yardage out of this. Tips the disc, runs after it, decides to tip it again, <laughs> loses control a little bit, floats up a little bit higher than he means for it to, catches it, and it's just this moment where you can, you can see him smiling on the oh, video d- as he's doing this. You could hear the, cr- the best was the crowd. The first tip, the first tip they're like, yeah, and then the second tip, they all just start laughing. You literally hear laughter ripple through the crowd yeah. on the tape. I uh, love it. So if he tips that all the way down the field, it's a goal. It's a Callahan. Yeah, this would have been amazing. <laughs> and it's a Callahan where he would have to get. I mean, it's like a Callahan, but he's throwing it to himself. So you can't get an assist on a Callahan to yourself. But would the player who threw that still get charged with the throwing a goal to the other team? I suppose so. Well, yeah, there's no that, possession, so it happened. So speaking of which, statistically, do we charge players with negative goals when they throw Callahan's? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't think we do, but that's. I mean, it's like I'm intrigued by this it's, idea. It's like worse than a turnover, you just, know? It's not just a turnover. It's not just a turnover because they get then they get the pullback. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, what was it? What was it? Salmi was yelling at him as he was running by him. <laughs> I sure. saw it on Twitter. It was like. Someone was just running by yelling stats at him, I think. <laughs> you can up your stats. Something along those lines. Uh, he's, I mean, Don Rico does it. He's like the human highlight, really. He's, <laughs> he's constantly doing things that I haven't seen people do before. And that was, this is my current favorite and will have trouble getting dethroned, I think. I was happy I got a chance to see that. I wasn't there in person much further away, but seeing that live, it was just, it was a joy. It was joyful. <laughs> it was joyful. <laughs> This is, I like this. We have a theme going here. Joy. Oh, uh, it's a good thing. Joy is a good thing. So, yeah, when we talk about the DC, sort of what their troubles are, mm-hmm. they play during the rest of the game, and during every single quarter, except for the fourth quarter, they have a positive goal differential. And they give up one and a third breaks in the first quarter, one and a third breaks in the second quarter, and they give up half a break in the third quarter. That makes the, even less sense. In the fourth quarter, they give up three and change breaks. So they give up three breaks in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, and they're minus 2.67 points in the fourth quarter. And a lot of that has to do with New York seems to have their number in the fourth quarter. So they make these comebacks in the end, either to win or whatever, but I'm not sure what the total issue is in this specific game. One of their key handlers, Lloyd Blake, went down with an injury, uh, not related to another player, just all by himself. 
and that uh, certainly contributed to their difficulties handling. But this is the thing that DC has to learn how to answer and has to learn how to deal with is yeah. adversity comes most in the fourth quarter because your opponent realizes they're running out of time. They start throwing everything plus the kitchen sink at you and you need to be able to respond either with consistency, as you mentioned, Portland does sort of the same thing all game. Yeah. But that same thing is really difficult to stop. It's a really good end. thing. Yeah. yeah. They're singing the same song, but it's an excellent song. I like that song. I will listen to that song. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas some other teams totally change up what they do in the fourth quarter, use some different lineups, use some different strategies on offense. Uh, DC, I'm not sure what their plan is in the fourth quarter. It looks discombobulated. And yeah, I'm biased because I watched this game and they were missing their key handler, but a little worried about what happens. Yeah. Do you think it's conditioning or is it mental or do you think it's also strategy? It, it certainly doesn't seem to be conditioning mm -hmm. because they're not slowing down their cuts, but I feel like if you're we mentioned this a little bit. Uh, I feel like if you're using the same strategy and the other team is sort of keyed in on that a little bit, they yeah. can take it away from you. So if you're handler-centric throughout the whole game, the other team's going to be like, okay, well, they're not throwing deep right away. Yeah. We're going to front you uh, near the disc. We're going to bump you near the disc, find some other way to disrupt you. Are we talking about last year's Philadelphia team? <laughs> <laughs> I, Wait, I lost track. Shots fired. I zoned out for a minute. <laughs> shots fired at Philadelphia. You're in Philadelphia. You know that, right? Yeah, I have to, I have to constantly fire shots at them to prove I don't have a bias. Philadelphia it's, fans are dangerous. They are the most dangerous. My son <laughs> being one of them. I was at a Philly game and my three-year-old son is sitting next to me and they're just beating New York down. It's that one game that was really out, uh, lopsided. And New York's going down the field. I'm like, come on, New York. Just score. And Beckett looks at me and goes, don't say come on, New York. Say, come on, spinners. <laughs> and he just looks back at the field. I'm like, sorry, but... <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's, um, this is what I'm trying to figure out. This is one of my projects for this week and next week is what yep. is going on with DC in the fourth quarter? Like, what's their deal, essentially? And I'll get to see them this weekend playing against Philadelphia. They'll come up here and we'll, we'll see what Beckett's thoughts are on DC <laughs> versus the spinners. But uh, I'll be happy to call that game. And that's one of the things I'm going to try to pay attention to a little bit more is do they change anything or do they not change anything? What's the, again... What's the deal? What's the deal with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be interesting against Philly, too, because Philly is like plus three in the first half and plus point one in the second half. Or yeah, they like slow that. down a little bit yeah. as the game goes on. And you were talking about this with Boston. Is one of the things you brought up in the Boston-Portland yeah. game is their ability to adjust um, coaching, right? I mean, adjustments are key. You go into the first half and you sort of see what happens and you adjust as much as you can during you know, the point breaks and during the quarter break, but that halftime is really where you're able to change things up. And if you don't make the right decisions then, it's gonna haunt you for the rest of the, the, rest of the game. And we talked to the coaching staffs before that game, and that, that was one of the things that they both keyed on, is we're not really gonna know what this team's like until we play against them for a half. And then yeah. we're gonna have to adjust for the second half. To Portland's credit, they played a much stronger second half than they played a first half. Uh, absolutely. Um, so speaking so, of coaching, speaking of, <laughs> well, let's, let's 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 wrap this real quick. The 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 upshot of all oh, of this right. yeah, yeah. is that Vancouver and New York have been relegated to spoiler role. Yes, that's that's their role in this thing now. And you know, for Vancouver, they have an opportunity to win the series against San Francisco, which would be a good accomplishment for them. Uh, and they can mess up other people's uh, Christmas Get in the you process. Getting buds while you may. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, New York, same thing. You know, New York's played spoiler to Philly before. The end of last season, they won a game against them toward the end, which took home field advantage away from Philly. Um, and really, in because it's Boston, took their chance to go to the championship <laughs> game away from them. Um, so they're, they're in that position again. And then we have D.C. and San Francisco, who are in desperation mode. Not technically eliminated. Both have to win out uh, in order to in order to make it. If DC w loses this weekend, they're out. Yeah. Uh, same thing for San Francisco. And then you have the battle, of course, for home field advantage in the playoffs. Um, which Portland? Did they wrap that up out there yet? No. No. They are very close. They're close. Though. They're close because they would win a tiebreaker. Yeah. Over Seattle, they were already two and zero versus Seattle, but. Technically, Seattle could finish. I mean, if Portland just starts losing games, if they lose all of the games, yeah. <laughs> then then we would have a change there. But right now, it looks like that's probably most likely going to be Seattle and Portland playing in Portland is the guess. But who knows? I mean, crazy things have happened. Yeah. And then we have the Philly Boston race that DC is going to try to try to jump in on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it should be an exciting season. Looking forward to this weekend. We just have two games this weekend, right? Yep. Uh, so. 
Then we got DC coming up to Philly, and then San Francisco yeah, and Seattle. Seattle and Vancouver. Seattle and Vancouver. Yeah. Sorry, Seattle and Vancouver. Vancouver plays Seattle. Yeah. So uh, should be good. Uh, let's move on though, as we said, because we're gonna blow right through time with three people. <laughs> Can't keep track of the time. Well. So your, your shirt today. Oh yeah, we can go to that too. That's going to get us into the conversation. Sure. I'm using these things as segues. No, uh, this is all very I planned out. I was doing the, the more difficult segue of just saying, so how about that? So how about that coaching? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is a John Doe polo. This yeah. is not our official jersey. This is one of our uh, wearing shirts, as some of the folks like one to say. wearing <laughs> shirts. Okay. Um, as a coach, this is what I wear when I'm coaching. Very nice. Uh, it's, we, get, we have the Magritte sort of style here with the uh, mustache and glasses with no face and hat on it. The reason I'm wearing this is we're in our tryout process right now. We started that uh, two weekends ago with DoeFest, which is where we just had some folks come out and play Frisbee. So it's okay. not, we did like Goldtimate, we did Mini, we did all these little things. Had some uh, women in DC coming out with that as well. So the idea is just to create a community environment and have some folks who are interested in the team learn what it's like to be around our team. So they're tryouts, but not official tryouts. Official tryouts start Wednesday, and then we have our next set of tryouts on Sunday. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. It's, it's fantastic. I, I, one of our players who uh, is returning, one of our captains, sort of said, you know, this is kind of like a fantasy football draft. You get to select your players <laughs> and then see how the season goes. Put, put goes. a roster together. It's like, yeah. you're, that, that's accurate. Yeah. But there's way more than that. Yeah, there's, there's, other, there's other pieces. We're not just dealing with statistics here. We're dealing with how is this all going to fit together. <laughs> I like the I like the dough fest yeah. idea. That's good. It was we, fun. We, we had that up end. where I grew up in the middle of nowhere in New York, <laughs> but it was more about shooting deer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a female deer. A female deer. <laughs> and uh, onto the drop of Golden Sun, uh, you are uh, coaching uh, who right now? Boston University. Not right now, but not right now. But we just finished our season. Yeah. Uh, BU men's A team. How'd you guys do this year? Uh, we did okay. We made it to uh, regionals and we placed tenth. Uh, I think is where we ended up, out of 16. Uh, had some had some good games, had some tough losses to teams like uh, Harvard and uh, and Tufts, but uh, overall it was a good season. Are they still the Ozone Pilots? Is that the correct team? They for are them? still the Ozone Pilots. Right on. Ozone Pilots. <laughs> I always like that name. Yeah, Ozone Pilots. I'm for it. So let's talk a little bit about coaching because we have a couple of coaches here. Uh, I coached one time in my life as a soccer coach for a year. And that was plenty. <laughs> uh, I, I've never been able to translate. I, I was talking to Jay Dono about this once. We, we talk about a lot, a good friend of ours. I've never been able to translate what I'm doing on the field to tell somebody else how to do it. <laughs> it's like, you go and you get it. Just go and get it. But I think that you have a very different, because particularly you, we were talking about this earlier, you have a very different approach. You're actually pretty technical about how you like to do what you do. Oh, yeah. From the ground up. You want to talk a little bit about uh, that kind of philosophy? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, I feel like you have to start, especially in college and a little bit in club as well, you've got to start with the basics. And, you know, you will get a number of kids on the team that have maybe never touched a disc before or have never played a point of ultimate before. That still happens? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it still happens. It's becoming somewhat more rare, though. It is becoming more rare. Yeah. We, we get a lot of kids who've played uh, high school and some who've played middle school. But you will get those guys who've just never played a game of organized ultimate in their life. And you've got to start from the basics. That was me. <laughs> you start with the, you know, the flicks and backhands, and that's relatively easy. But you've also got to teach people how to cut. You've got to teach them the basics of it. You've got to teach them footwork. You know, you've got to tell them how you're going to mark and where you should be standing and what you should be looking for and what your feet should be doing. And at least from, from my experience, if you take all that, you put it together, uh, at the end of the season, you, you create those good habits that people will have. And it's hopefully something they'll have for a long time. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully they haven't forgotten by the time they get back next year. Well, you never know. They are coming. <laughs> <laughs> some, uh, some folks just take to it, though. It's, this is one of the things that I have difficulty with when I'm coaching is that I take a lot of things for granted as a coach. Yeah. Uh, I learned not to last season over the course of the process because I hadn't coached in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I've played sports literally my entire life. Mm. So I, I don't understand not having field sense, but it's one of the things I take, I take the most enjoyment in watching players who have field sense. So yeah. how do I teach that? And with coaching club, it's a lot of players who have come from different systems and mm -hmm. players who aren't, they're not fully formed as players, 
but we have to figure out how to get these different styles to mesh together and how we're going to make that work. Teaching fundamentals, it's key, yeah. and I need to, like, it's one of those things that I always have to remind myself. We have to go over the basics over and over and over again. It's just like teaching. It's just, it's almost an exercise in frustration, yeah. but that's the job. <laughs> so the thing that I like to tell my guys when I've been coaching at BU and also at Hartford previously was uh, you take a lot of these guys who have played together. Some have played club, some have played together on college, some have played high school. And at the end of the day, there are plenty of good ways to play ultimate. There are a lot of right ways to play. But you say to them, or I say to them, this is how we're playing. We are doing X, Y, and Z, and that is our game. And that's it. You know, I don't, I don't want to see you trying to do something more than what our game plan is. Because if you're on the same page, you can play extremely well as a team, and that's how you're going to win. This and if you're not, you, no matter how good your team is, yeah, you can still you can still lose. This is one of the things I struggle with because I like to, as a spectator, as a coach, as a player, I like to see individuals express themselves on the field. I like to see their individual personalities come through, mm -hmm. and find a way to do that within the structure of the team. Yeah, and I have difficulty like tamping down on that because I like to see people do things that are outside of the system. That's what makes me have the most fun as a player, <laughs> as a coach, as a spectator. So it's another thing. I like that so much, and it's so much more enjoyable on some level. But you have to, like. Compress it a little bit. Yeah. You have to, like 80, the 80 20, 80 20 rule is something that people have always said to me. You do 80% of what you're, what you're scripted to do, and 20% mm -hmm. you have to improvise because you get uh, caught up in situations that are not the same. Yeah. I thought that was 99 and 1%, isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe in an office. 1% in inspiration, 99% <laughs> perspiration, isn't that right? Isn't that what it is? I don't think I had that one wrong. Um, so, yeah, you're doing the tryout thing now, you're done for the season, but what I think is interesting is that college is a little bit different, uh, at least in probably at BU, than it is during club, because you actually are going to have an opportunity, usually, to have the same player with you for four years. And I think in a lot of the club teams, turnover, uh, particularly in the not the top, top club teams, turnover is probably a little bit higher, right? Um, so what do you, like player development-wise... How big a part of that is, you know, do you have A and B teams? Are you thinking about player development a lot? Like, what is the, what's your approach there? Well, for us, we had around 200 kids come out for that first tryout, the, <laughs> first, the first week of school, which was terrifying. It's exhausting. <laughs> so myself, as assistant coach, uh, Matt Heath, who used to play for the Whitecaps, is another yeah. assistant coach, and Brian Buck is our head coach, who's also the voice of the Whitecaps. Uh, mm -hmm. The three of us, plus four captains on the team, were able to sort of figure out how you're going to manage all those people. And eventually you get down to an A and a B team. You get usually 30 guys on each or, you know, 40, maybe 40 guys on the B team that show up sporadically. So you're turning away 120 see, people. That's the thing, though. We never turn people away. We don't want to turn people away. We just sort of show people what it's going to be like. And if you want to play competitively on a team that's, you know, fairly serious but also has a fun side to it, then ultimate's for you. But if you just want to play intramural soccer, then... Yeah, go play intramural. Then intramural soccer is yeah. for you. Intramural. Yeah. If you want to play an intramural sport, then intramural sport. Is if intramural soccer is for you, then play croquet. <laughs> you very confusing. Even, yes. even in club, this is how I got my start playing with Pike, is that I was the bottom of the roster. Mm. There may have been one person or two people in this about the same level, but there weren't any roster limits at that point. And Pike basically said to me, you can keep coming out. We'd love to have you. <laughs> you run around a lot. You're probably not <laughs> going to play on tournament weekends. So I got to learn at practices so much from so many players that were so much better than me yeah. at that point mm. um, that that was sort of what got me into Ultimate. I learned, every, I learned all the things that you can do that I wasn't doing yet. And that's one of the things that I have some issues with as a coach right now is that there are strict roster limits and there are issues with moving from one team to another and all of that. So. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's difficult to encourage someone to come back to your team and always be there and create that sense of you can learn from us, but we can't put you in in games when there are tight restrictions on it. It's a tough decision as a player to make too, isn't it? Uh, because especially... Not for, me. not for you. I was terrible. I mean, I wasn't terrible, but like... You weren't terrible. No. I was I, I bad played, I compared to the, the all-stars that were on that team. Yeah, that team was stacked. <laughs> uh, but you... you it's a tough decision, I think, for a lot of players yes. to say, all right, I could go start for this club team or mm -hmm. start for, you know, in this area, play a lot here, 
or I could go literally never play for this other team, but I'm going to develop a lot more there, you know. And that's a tough call. We have a lot of people do it for, for our teams who yep. come in as practice players. They're never going to play. They're never going to see the field. They're never going to be on the roster for a game. But they come out to practice. They come out because they want to learn. They want to get better. If you're getting challenged every week, that's what it's about. Yeah. Yep. Testing your limits, finding out where your limits are, seeing how much better other people actually are than you and accepting that and taking that on as a challenge. Do you have movement between the A and B squad throughout the season? Like, is there other people that graduate up kind of during the season or that it's, get relegated? It's rare. It's yeah. rare, but it does happen. And you, you sort of use that a little bit, almost as a little bit of a, as a threat. You know, yeah. if, you're, if you're not coming, you're not, if you're not coming to practice, if you're not being serious, if you don't show up to tournaments, then we're going to bring somebody to the A team who wants to play and wants to play seriously. Yeah. But... You know, and, and then also sometimes you'll find a guy on the B team who's just you know, showing he's, up. Yeah, he's ready to go, and he's and he's ready to learn some more, and you can bring him up. I think that, I think that's it. That's that's the fun part of being a coach. I feel like there are there's a bottomless well of things that we could talk about. This coaching <laughs> no, thing. So we're gonna have to do this again. We're gonna do the coaching thing again. But we're literally way over time already. <laughs> it's, it felt that way. Yeah. So some people are getting to the end of their commute right now and are annoyed with this because <laughs> they're still in their car. Like I, I gotta finish this. I guess. <laughs> what a waste. I'm gonna sit in the parking lot. Be for late a to work. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna wrap up. We didn't get to everything we were gonna talk to today, but that's okay. Yeah, no, nobody really listens to this anyway, so it's going to be fun. Really fun. <laughs> I got stopped on the way up to, my, to the press box in, at the game this weekend. Somebody was like, hey, I listen every week. I literally get that all the time. I it's had no idea. I, I literally I thought think it's we were, because we're spread out on so many different platforms, and you can sort of download it without You can't tell noticing. how many people, yeah. It's surprising. I, I did piece it together once, and it is a decent number of people. People but, know my name. Yeah. I have a hard time knowing my own name. That's <laughs> <laughs> the mirror is a weird moment in the morning. <laughs> oh, you look in the mirror. That's your first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can always, of course, get me at, at Nick Darling, and I see Darling on Twitter, at DustTweetR, or DustTweeter. You're doing a great D -U -S -T -W -E -E -T -R. job. D-U-S-T-W-E-E-T-R. Uh, you get us both at, at Cleats Cufflinks. Thank you very much for David for uh, coming on here and sitting between us, which is probably one of the least comfortable places to be in the world. Um, and we'll see you next week on Cleats and Cufflinks.